Don, can you hear me? Okay, I can hear you too, good. And Tammy, is that you or Dave or both? Okay. Yes, yes, it's just me and I can hear you fine. All right, super, good to have you tonight. All right, well, we are, uh, we are running just a, a minute late here, a couple minutes late. So let's, let's go ahead and, uh, hi Jeff. Oh, Sherry. Father, in Jesus' name, we bow before you. Uh, you're so good to us. Thank you for another night when we can get together as brothers and sisters in Christ, and we can, we can uh, bow before you, let you know how much we love you, and we can get into your word. And we're asking you, Lord, for understanding tonight, for wisdom in your word. We want to be able to apply this to our lives and to live the lives that please you uh, because we love you. And uh, Lord, we pray for Larry Hunt tonight. We ask you that you'd help him to get to feeling better. We pray for uh, Rick and Barb uh, for uh, their loss and their family and ask you, Lord, that you would be the hope for that family uh, like we know that you are. And, uh, and Father, we know that there's others that may be sick or, or uh, need your comforting and we ask for all of that tonight in Jesus' name, amen, amen. amen. All right, well, um, Let's, uh, yes. What was that about Rick and Barb? Uh, Barb's sister, was it her, her brother Ricky, uh, passed away unexpectedly. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, we're in Psalm 119, and uh, we're, we're in the series called Bible Life for those online that may not know that. And uh, this is the 15th episode, and it's the 14th section that we've gone through. And uh, in Bible life, just as a reminder, each section of eight verses, uh, each line of those eight verses begins with uh, a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And tonight, the letter is what? None. None. And, uh, and it's pronounced pretty much like that. Actually, it's just slightly different, but it's not different enough to, I think, none is close enough. Uh, and uh, for those that uh, might want to see, if you haven't seen, it looks like that. And you guys have probably seen that. Yeah. All right. And so the letter, none. And uh, let me get back to where I was. <laughs> so uh, tonight, I know last week we had a, a verse that I said that uh, was just one of my favorite verses in Psalm 119, and we are in this second, uh, in this uh, um, 14th section, the section of none, this has another one that is just, uh, I mean, you see it on plaques and on people's, uh, you know, decorations in their home and stuff like that. It's a kind of, a kind of verse you would paint on a plate and hang it on the wall. Uh, it's verse 105. Let's have somebody read verse 105, please. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Your word is a lamp and a light. A lamp and a light. Um, let me ask you this. Is, is the word of God actually a lamp? And is the word of God actually a light? Pardon me? Yes, it shows you the way. It shows you the way. But I mean, does it have candle power? Does it, uh, can you measure it by watts? Is it, uh, is it uh, if we, you know, is it similar to the lights we have in here? I don't know. Revelation says that, that we won't need the sun because Jesus it will be the light. Play long, sister. It's, uh, <laughs> if, if the Bible says it, that's what it is. <laughs> I want to. I want to. I want to propose this to you. It's, it's not a flashlight. It's not a, a lantern. Spiritually, it is though, right? Spiritually, it is. Uh, can I go camping and, and take a, a night hike uh, with the Word of God in my hand instead of a flashlight and not run into a tree? I guess that'd be a lot of faith. That'd be a lot of faith. <laughs> <laughs> so it, if it's if it's not that kind of a light. Um, 
what kind of a light or a lamp is it? And we've kind of answered that already, but somebody have a, a different answer for that? What kind of a light is the Word of God? What kind of a lamp? It's illuminating. It illuminates what? It shows you where your feet should be going. Okay. And, and again, your literal feet, maybe, but more what? Spiritual. Your spiritual, where you're going with your life, right? Where you're headed with your life, what path you're on in your light, are you walking the paths of righteousness for his name's sake? And uh, there's no path, well, there probably is a path somewhere named righteousness, I don't know. But uh, that's not the point. The point is, you know, this, this is crazy talk tonight. But, uh, but let's, let's think about spiritual applications here tonight. Um, when a pilot, uh, when a pilot's sight fails, and that happens, and uh, Marsha mentioned tonight there's uh, fog outside, and she said, oh, it's really foggy, and I said, well, that plays right into not tonight's lesson. Uh, if, if you're flying a plane tonight, you not only have darkness, but you've got fog and clouds and all that kind of stuff, um, so how do you fly a plane? Your instrument. You fly by instrument, right? What does that mean? Fly by the seat of your pants. The seat of your pants? <laughs> no. <laughs> what, what does it mean to fly by instruments? You have instruments in front of you that tell you, or show you even, whether or not you're level, or if, you know, if this wing's a little higher than the other one, and where you need to make your adjustments. I you guess. can't really fly that way, though, right? I guess so. Yeah, you can. <laughs> <laughs> I've never you flown, can. but I'm assuming um, you can. There's a tool used by training pilots to train new pilots when they get to a certain advanced level of their training. And uh, that, that tool is uh, it, it's called Foggles. Have you heard of Foggles? <laughs> I, I am, it's a funny term, Foggles. And what it is, is it's goggles. You know the, uh, the old the old person uh, sunglasses, and I say that being an old person, the old person sunglasses that go over your glasses yeah. and they've got even the side things on them and they're big square like television screens on your, on your face. They kind of fit like that so they'll go over glasses if you're wearing glasses, but if not, uh, what it does is the upper part, like probably 90% of the lens is fogged over. And, and the bottom part is clear so that you can see the instruments. But the pilot can't see out the window anymore. He can't see side to side anymore. He's got no peripheral vision. The only thing he can see are the instruments, unless he cheats. <laughs> and sometimes they cheat and they have to take the lesson over. But uh, the flight instructor um, has a student put on the foggles and, uh, and through a large part of their advanced training, they have to fly that way. Uh, why do you think they do that? Because they have to do it in reality. Yeah, you're going to run into that. You're going to run into that. And, and unexpectedly you could run into that, uh, where you take off from somewhere, and it's great, the weather report doesn't really say, but all of a sudden something sweeps in, and, and, uh, or you have engine trouble, you have to go off course somewhere, and you go somewhere where you can't see, uh, and, and all of a sudden you're having, you, you must fly by the instruments. Um, and uh, it takes away their crutch. They can no longer rely on landmarks. They can no longer, uh, one of the things that the pilots uh, say when they've got these foggles on is that uh, the thing they miss the most is seeing the runway. They, they really, they count on being able to see the runway and see the lights on the runway. But with the foggles, you can't. And uh, you must land the plane uh, by, by radio instruction from the tower and from your instruments. And, uh, and uh, like I say, if, you, if the student cheats, and uh, they showed some films, uh, I kind of caught up on this today, and showed some films of, of guys doing this, <laughs> trying to look up to see through the windshield. Uh, and uh, God has um, a set of foggles for you and me too. Um, when we find ourselves in trouble, and we can't tell what's up or down or right or wrong, uh, sometimes, uh, he says, here's your foggles. Uh, we're we're going to let you fly by uh, the word of God instead of by sight. That's, doesn't the Bible say? We, we walk by faith, not by, sight. not by sight. God means that when he says that. We, we walk by faith and not by 
sight. It's, it's uh, living, it, it's when uh, your sight goes away, when things are unsure, bloop, you have to go by instruments. And, and in, in the spiritual sense, you have to go by what the Word of God says and trust it. If the pilot doesn't trust his instruments, and he feels like, because sometimes, uh, I don't know if you've been on some amusement rides and things, but I know at Indiana Beach, there's that ride that goes, and at the end of it, it looks like you're going toward a train. It, you've all probably been on that, or most of you. Um, there's a point where it feel, it, there's a thing going in a circle, and then it goes dark, and it feels like, oh, no, but when the lights come back on, you're just sitting straight up. But it does something to your mind. That happens to pilots. They believe they're upside down, and they've got to right themselves. And, uh, and you've got to trust your instruments. They think that instrument has to be wrong, uh, but uh, they have to trust it. And we have to trust the Word of God. Um, and, uh, and so when uh, verse 105 says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. He's saying that, that uh, this is a dark world and you need a light. You need to know the direction. You need to, you need to be able to trust something to show you the right way. And the something is not the world. The something is the word of God. He says, that's what your word is to me. Uh, think about it. It's a lamp to my feet, so I can see, if it's a lamp under my feet, then I can see maybe the next step, maybe the next two steps, but it's also a light under my path, and so you hit the brights, and you can see a little further down the path, but God generally doesn't give us the whole flight pattern, does he? He generally doesn't give us the whole flight plan. Um, it's like Abraham, who he said, go to this distant country, I'll tell you where you're going, but you get going. And uh, it's for us, a lot of times, he gives us our assignments in short bursts, in short sections, and we have to trust him that he's not going to get us out there in the middle of nowhere and then leave us. And, uh, and he's the God who says, I won't, I won't leave you or forsake you, and I won't leave you as orphans. And so we trust him in that. And that's kind of what Jesus did. You wonder why Thomas freaked out in, uh, in John uh, 14 when Jesus said, uh, you, you know, you know where I'm going and you know the way there. And Thomas says, whoa, whoa, no, I don't know. What are you talking about, Lord? Uh, and Jesus says, hey, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the light. Uh, I'm the life and, and nobody comes to the Father except through me. And so we got to trust Jesus is anchored in heaven and, uh, and we got to follow him. And, and we follow him by instruments. We follow him by the word of God. Um, any other discussion on that before we go further? Love that verse. I just think about IFR and VFR. Yeah, what's that? The VFR is flying with your visual, and IFR is flying with your, with your instruments. Yeah, see, it's been too long since I've flown a plane, so, yeah. I was 17, I think, when I took my last lesson. That was um, a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Look, <laughs> let's, let's move on. She's, she's been like this all day. <laughs> Look further in Psalm 119. Look at 130. Somebody read verse 130. We'll get to this and we'll talk about it later, but it goes right along with this. The unfolding of your word gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. Hey, I'm the simple. You know what? Um, so the unfolding of your words, the revealing of your words, the illumination of your words, it gives light uh, and it imparts understanding to the simple. It goes right along with verse 105. Uh, Matthew 15, 14. Let's turn there. Hang on to where you're at in Psalm 119. But let's look at Matthew 15, 14 and see what Jesus said. Somebody would read that. Leave them, they are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Blindness is like darkness. It's like those foggles. And some people have different kinds of blindness, right? Some people can see a fog or, or uh, see shapes, but legally they're blind. They really can't navigate. They can't drive a car, or that kind of thing. But um, there's also total blindness and total darkness. And uh, I don't know what that's like, but I know it takes your sight away. And so uh, he says, let them alone. He's talking about the Pharisees. Let them alone. They're blind guides. 
They're blind preachers. They're blind examples. They're your blind leaders, he says. And the blind lead the blind. Both of them are going to fall into a pit. And uh, today, if you're following a preacher, or if you're, if you're part of a, a congregation where the, the preaching and the ministry and the Bible studies, and, that they're not teaching and preaching the Word of God as it's written, if they're not preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, as, as uh, Paul says, uh, let them be accursed, get ready for Pitt City. I mean, you are, you are following a blind leader who's leading you right into a pit. And, uh, and there are many people following false leaders, false, uh, false teachers, uh, false preachers, and it's dangerous. Um, we need to uh, not only be good students of listening to the Word of God being taught and preached, but we got to go home and verify it in Scripture ourselves. Because Jim Moore can be wrong. It's hard to believe. But Jim Moore can be wrong. And so you need to look and challenge me when you think it's wrong. And there's been some of you that have done that. And I don't, I don't throw punches when that happens. I, I appreciate it because I want to be on the right path. I don't want to teach and preach something wrong. I don't want to live something wrong. Uh, let's turn to John chapter 1. And uh, I'm going to read this, but I want us to look at this because there's, there's some key things here that go right along with verse 105. John 1, verse 1, we, we know this, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Here's, here's some key stuff. Verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Um, Jesus is the word of God. Uh, he is the word of God. And, uh, um, and if Jesus is the word of God, and we're going to look at that and verify that here with more scripture, uh, but if he's the word of God, it says that, that uh, he has come into the world. He is the light of men. Light shines in the darkness. The darkness has not overcome it. Some of your versions may say it differently. What's your say in verse... Does not comprehend it. Does not comprehend it. Um, darkness doesn't like light, does it? No. no. The, those who are in darkness don't come to the light generally. Uh, Ephesians 6.12. Let's go there. Ephesians 6.12, somebody would read that for us. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against <coughs> principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Okay, uh, New King James says the darkness of this age. The ESV says this present <coughs> darkness. The NIV says the powers of this dark world. Um, this is a dark place. Hey, you need a light. You need a headlight. <laughs> you need a miner's helmet uh, to, to navigate in this world because it is a world of darkness. It is a world of sin and death and condemnation. And, uh, and we need to have that light of the gospel, the light of the word of God here on earth uh, to navigate. Uh, turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter 2. First Peter chapter 2, and let's have somebody read verses 7 and 8. I'm sorry. Yeah, 7 and 8. <clears throat> now to you who believe this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Is this what you want? Yes. Okay. Uh, has become the cornerstone, and the stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. In verse 9, if somebody read that. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellence of him who called you out of darkness 
into his marvelous light. Thank you. So, verse 8, they stumble because they disobey the word. Uh, verse 9, um, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous what? Light. His light. His light. Um, again, this is a dark place, and, and uh, without the light of the word of God in your life, without the truth, the, the light is the truth. God's word is truth. You won't find a more pure truth anywhere. If you want to know what is, is, uh, that's where you turn so that you're not fooled, you're not hoodwinked, you're not uh, cheated, you're, you're, you're going to be on the right path if you follow God's word. Um, the stone, the cornerstone, that's him, it's Jesus. Uh, Jesus is the word of God. Uh, Revelation 19, let's go there. Revelation 19, and if somebody would read verse 13 nice and loud, please. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. His name. Who is that talking about? Jesus. Jesus. His name is the Word of God. Harkens right back to John 1, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. He is the Word that always has been. Uh, Psalm 119. Let's go back to Psalm 119 here for just a moment. Psalm 119, 105. Let's have somebody read that again just to refresh our memories. It's been We've been now 20 plus minutes on on this, Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Okay, so it speaks of walking the pathway of this current life. And, and we've seen that, that the Bible says it's a dark place. Your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. And we're instructed to walk in the light, we've read that, and not in the darkness of this world. Uh, just listen to this, 1 John 1 says this in verses 6 and 7, If we say we have fellowship with him, the Lord, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, he says, while we walk in darkness, we lie. If we say we have fellowship with him, and we walk in darkness, but the way not to walk in darkness is to walk by the way the Word of God says. And so again, it's important. Walking in the light is only possible if it's the Word of God that lights our way. Uh, using God's Word to light our way is the only way you'll see clearly to avoid a pit. And uh, there's plenty of pits out there to fall in. And uh, uh, try night hiking with just books. <clears throat> And uh, I say that because I looked at some uh, so-called self-help books, and uh, let's see if any of these are the light that we can hike with in the dark. Um, take Your Life Back, How to Stop Letting the Past and Other People Control You. That's probably not going to do it. Uh, Get Out of Your Own Way, Practical Lessons for Conquering Guilt and More. Practical Lessons for Conquering Guilt that would be repentance, right? Uh, what to say when you talk to yourself. <laughs> good job. <laughs> yeah, good job, buddy. <laughs> Stopping the noise in your head. The new way to overcome anxiety and worry. Uh, blink. I like this one. Blink. The power of thinking without thinking. <laughs> like I say, try to hike with any of these things. Uh, no, God's word is what we hike with. God's word is what we travel life with. God's word lights our path before us, lets us know what is the right way, and, uh, and Christ is the right way. Uh, otherwise, welcome to Pit City, baby. You're, you're going to fall in a pit. Only the word of God will do. And uh, God's word is a lamp for my next safe step. And uh, I, I find myself sometimes, uh, just as a confession, I find myself sometimes taking a step and then checking God's word. And uh, I just did that recently. And I won't tell you how because it's embarrassing. But, um, and I'm sure we all do that from time to time. We need those foggles. He's got to put us in situations and help us to trust him uh, because uh, we fail the test so many times. Um, 
The Bible's our light, our book of light, and not a book of darkness. There's no darkness at all in the book. There's no deception in the book, in, in God's word. There's no deception in the Bible. And uh, John 3.19 says this. You don't have to turn there. John 3.19 says this, and this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were what? Evil. evil. Their works are evil. Proverbs 4, let's go ahead and turn there. And yes, there is more than just one verse in this section. We'll cross into another one here shortly. Proverbs what? Proverbs 4, and let's have somebody read verses 18 and 19. The path of the righteous is like the morning sun, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. But the wicked of the wicked is like deep dark, or the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. You know, they don't know what makes them stumble. Well, they're walking in the dark. They've got that book blink, you know, thinking without thinking uh, and, and trusting their own wisdom. Um, as we grow in God's word, gaining wisdom from it daily, our pathway in life should be getting brighter and brighter. That's what Proverbs 4 is saying. As we walk that path, the pathway should be getting brighter and brighter. As we grow in the word of God, as we grow in Jesus Christ, and, and as we obey the Word of God, um, because, listen, if, if you know the Word of God, but you disobey it over and over and over again, um, you know, the Lord's just going to keep putting the foggles on you, because you need more training, and you're not growing, and you're not, you're stunting your own growth. Um, it doesn't mean that we'll never sin. It doesn't mean that at all. We are imperfect beings and uh, creatures that need God's uh, forgiveness. Uh, but our, the intention of our hearts should be obedience because we love him. We don't want to displease him. And, uh, and so uh, our life, our path should be getting brighter and brighter. It should become more and more clear to us uh, where we should be going and how we should please the Lord in the way we live. Um, and so let's move on to 106 unless somebody has another issue or topic there. I was just thinking, doesn't it seem like the closer you get to God and the clo more you know his word, the more sin you realize you still have in your life that you need to clean out? Yeah, yeah. Just... That, that example that I use where uh, Jesus says our, our, uh, those who follow him uh, don't have the broad road, we have the difficult road to a narrow gate. And, and I contend that that gate for the Christian, the, the longer you're a Christian and the more you study the Word of God, for me anyway, that gate gets narrower and narrower because I find that in my life, uh, the, the Holy Spirit, the Word of God reveals to me that there's still things in my life I've got to jettison, I've got to get them out. Um, and, and he doesn't do that all at one time. Uh, he, he knows that he has your lifetime, and he knows what your lifetime is, how many years, how many days, how many minutes, um, and so he knows he's got this much to work with, and, and he will work with you to sanctify you through your walk with him. Uh, but I, I believe that, yeah, the Word of God continues to, to illuminate in your life and in your heart the things that, that are needing change, the things that are needing repentance. And it, I think it also, it can make you feel like, if you're not careful, kind of get you down because it can make you feel like, I'm never going to be good enough. I'm never going to be clean enough. And, and we're not. That's when we have to put all of our trust and faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross. Because we're never going to be clean enough. Not on our own. Mm -hmm. Not on our own. Only in Christ. Preach it, sister. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Verse 106, please, if somebody would read that in Psalm 119. I have taken an oath and confirmed it that I will follow your righteous laws. Okay. Uh, this man is determined 
to know and to obey God's word and his commands. Uh, again, that... Oh, come on. I've sworn an oath. I confirmed it to keep your righteous rules. He's determined to know God's word. He's determined to obey God's word and his commands. He has set his heart upon it, upon walking with God, and he knows that the best way to do that, to know and to um, confirm it, is to obey the word of God. He says in, in the last line there of verse 106, to keep your righteous rules. Uh, did you notice that he said that he both swore an oath and he confirmed the oath? He, he has sworn and he has confirmed it. Uh, just how do we confirm an oath that we've sworn to God when we say, um, like he says, I've sworn an oath and confirmed it to keep your righteous rules. So that was the oath. I'm going to keep your righteous rules. And, and I have to believe that he's, that he's saying that in, in the way that he, it's not that he will never fail, but that's what his heart is set upon, is keeping God's rules. How did he confirm it? By keeping God's rules. Yeah, by, 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 yeah, you said the same thing, by, by demonstration of complying to God's rules, of complying to God's laws, of obeying it, uh, by living that oath daily. Uh, so the psalmist is reminding God and himself that he's sworn this oath, uh, and, and that it can be witnessed uh, that his heart intends to keep the oath. How? because he's already walking that oath. He's, he's keeping God's law and his word, and, uh, and he, he wants to, he intends to keep it. Um, so when, when we fail, though, uh, God's mercy is so abundant, and uh, uh, 1 John 1, verse 9 says, if we confess our sins... And John's talking to people who are believers. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Um, but be careful, because I'm not saying that it's okay to sin. Uh, John or uh, Paul says in, in Romans 6, 1 and elsewhere, uh, is it okay to sin since grace abounds? And then he says, no, certainly not. Stop sinning. Uh, we, we need to stop sinning. Remembering that Romans 7, he says, O oh, wretched man that I am, uh, who will save me from this body of sin? He had that battle, the same battle we have. His heart intends to keep God's word, uh, but in the flesh we know that we're imperfect. But again, if we confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive us. And, uh, and so, but high-handed sins... Uh, it's probably been a while since I've mentioned that, but high-handed sins, uh, like old Dr. Black uh, used to say at uh, Johnson Bible College, is when you know you know what, what sin is, and you come to a crossroads, and there's the right way, and there's the sinful way, and you say, uh, Lord, I know that that's wrong, but I'm going to do it because I know that you have to forgive me. That is so terrible. You are smacking God in the face there, and that is, a, that is a dangerous sin to sin when you know it and you say, I know it, but I know you have to forgive me if I ask you. No, he doesn't. He's God. Who are you to, to tell God what he's going to do? And so um, let's be careful there, and, and I'm sure we are. Let's go to verse 107. Have somebody read that, please. I am severely afflicted. Give me life, O oh Lord, according to your word. Okay, um, I want to I want to focus because we know that he has been severely afflicted. We talked about that quite a bit. Uh, within Psalm 109, we see that he's severely afflicted. He's got enemies uh, because of his stand for God um, and for his word. Um, but that uh, give me life. I want to talk about that. Give me life, O oh Lord. According to your word, says the ESV, the NIV says, preserve my life, Lord, according to your word. 
Uh, the New King James Version says, Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. And we've gone over this before. Uh, this man was greatly afflicted. Uh, those who hated him because he loved and served the Lord God, and he obeyed his word, and, uh, and he's seeking for revival. He's seeking for a refreshing. He's seeking for a breath of life, a breath, a fresh breath of life uh, from God. That, uh, you know, and he says, give me life, preserve my life, revive me according to what? According to your word. So he, he's asking it because he says, I know you'll do that because that's what your word says you'll do. Does the word say that? That if we ask, he'll refresh us? Well, let's turn to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah 40. And uh, let's have somebody read verses 29 to 31, please. 29 to 31. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youth grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on the wings of e like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow faint. Thank you. So he gives power to the faint. Uh, to him who has no might, he increases their strength. In verse 31, he says, if you wait on the Lord, you're, he's going to renew their, your strength. You're going to mount up with wings like eagles. You're going to run and not grow weary. You're going to walk and you're not going to faint. Um, God uses our dependence on him in our weakness as something that glorifies him. He's happy to give us a refreshing breath of life, a revival of our life in him, if we call on him to do that. And uh, in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul says, but he said to me, this is Christ talking to, uh, to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more, Paul says, uh, gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Do you allow the Lord to use you like this for his glory? To be able to say to Christ, when I am weak, then I'm strong in you? Or does all our faithfulness for him go out the window when we're hurt or afraid or when things go wrong? It's a good question. In verse uh, 107, uh, the psalmist says in Psalm 119, I am severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. We're moving on now to verse 108. Verse 108 in Psalm 119. Accept my free will offerings of praise, O Lord, and teach me your rules. The NIV says, Accept, Lord, the willing praise of my mouth. And the New King James Version says, Accept, I pray, the free will offerings of my mouth. Uh, this word accept is used in these translations and shows uh, that the psalmist is offering God his praise. And he's asking God to accept his praise. Let's uh, reference right now Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15. Hebrews 13, 15. Through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips that acknowledge his name. Now, these free will offerings of praise to God are the songs of love for God that can't wait to escape from our hearts and get to God's ears. We freely praise him, not because God has a gun to our heads, but because our love for him is true. And so let me ask you all to think about this and uh, how, how, do we, uh, how do we offer praise to God? And is it genuine? 
And does he hear it frequently from us? Uh, that's a good question. Also, how do these two lines go together in, in uh, verse 108 of Psalm 119? Accept my free will offerings of praise, O Lord. And the second line there in that verse says, and teach me your rules. Accept my free will offerings of praise and teach me your rules. I think it goes together like this. The first line is basically saying, I love you. Please accept my love. And the second line says, I want to know you better. I want to know what you like and what you don't like so I can please you. So accept my free will offerings of praise, O Lord, and teach me your rules. We find out what God is all about by his testimony, by his word, by his rules, what he likes, what he doesn't like. And, uh, and so we move on now in uh, Psalm 119 to verse 109. Verse 109, I hold my life in my hand continually, but I do not forget your law. Um, and I, I'm going to share with you the, the a couple of other translations in some of these verses. I think it's important. It gives us a, a nice, well-rounded look at, at uh, what the psalmist is saying. Again, the ESV says, I hold my life in my hand continually, but I do not forget your law. The NIV says, though I constantly take my life in my hands, uh, the New King James Version says, my life is continually in my hand. Some Bible versions state it this way. My life is in continual danger. That's the New English translation. The New Living Translation says, my life, is, my life constantly hangs in the balance. Uh, these do not mean the same thing. The Hebrew phrase, uh, nefesh kef, or my life in my hand, or Palm, uh, that's what that means. Um, let's see how that same Hebrew phrase is used in other scripture passages. In Judges chapter 12, Judges 12, the men of Ephraim asked Jephthah uh, why he crossed over to fight the Ammonites without them. And Jephthah an answered this way in uh, Judges chapter 12, verse 2. Uh, the second part of that of that verse says, and I and my people had a great dispute with the Ammonites. And when I called you, you did not save me from their hand. Uh, verse three says, and when I saw that you would not save me, I took my life in my hand and crossed over against the Ammonites. Uh, that verse three, Judges 12, three, he says, and when I saw that you would not save me, uh, this is the key phrase here. I took my life in my hand. That's that same uh, Hebrew phrase. In 1 Samuel chapter 28, verse 21, uh, the medium says to King Saul, Behold, your servant has obeyed you. Now listen here. I have taken my life in my hand and have listened to what you have said to me. Again, I've taken my life in my hand. It's that same phrase, the same Hebrew phrase. Uh, so back to Psalm 119, verse 109, he says, I hold my life in my hand continually, but I do not forget your law. So I believe that the psalmist is saying here that he risks his own life by the way he lives for the Lord and how he obeys the word of God. And he's risking his life for his faith. Uh, he's doing that for God's glory while not compromising his obedience to the word of God. That's really commendable. Uh, let's go on to Psalm 119, verse 110. Verse 110. It says, The wicked have laid a snare for me, but I do not stray from your precepts. Now, there are some things that the psalmist could do uh, to sting his enemies. He may set a trap for them to bring them down, uh, or... He could lie and take some of the heat off of himself and say that he's not faithful to God. Um, one time uh, a while back, there was a, a group that I had on a bus that I was driving, and um, we got to talking about people who are martyred for Christ, uh, folks in other countries. Even today, 
that are, uh, are put to the test. Their captors will say, uh, you need to renounce Christ. You need to give up Jesus Christ and worship this other God. And they do not do it. And they uh, many times are beheaded or hanged or, or crucified or, or killed in some way. Well, one young lady on the bus said that uh, she would just lie. She would tell them that uh, she renounced Christ and uh, she will live another day and she would still be faithful to Christ. Well, why is that wrong? In Matthew chapter 10, Matthew 10, verse 32, uh, Jesus says, So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. That's what's wrong with it. Uh, we we are put against the wall sometimes. We are faced with some tough things sometimes, but we cannot give up Christ. And and uh, here the psalmist is saying, uh, the wicked have laid a, a snare for me, but I do not stray from your precepts. Well, part of those precepts happen to be that we remain loyal to the Lord and we don't give him up. We don't uh, renounce him. Verse 111 in Psalm 119. Uh, here we're coming toward the end. Verse 111, your testimonies are my heritage forever, for they are the joy of my heart. Your testimonies, your word, that's my heritage forever. Uh, that's what I want to be known as. That's what I want to pass on to my children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. I like to see that, uh, that the word of God is passed from generation to generation to generation. And uh, he says, your testimonies are my heritage forever, for they are the joy of my heart. Are the, are the words of God the joy of your heart? Uh, again, this is a kind of something as we read, we ought to be challenging our hearts and our minds and our, and our souls. Is the word of God that important to us? Is it a joy for us to spend time in his word? Um, and if the answer is no, or if the answer is I don't know, um, we really need to be in the word of God much more. It's a sign that you're not in the word enough, because the more you're in the word, the more you know our God and the more you love him and his word. Let's move on now to the final verse in this, ser in this uh, episode, verse 112 in Psalm 119. The psalmist says, I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever and to the end. I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end. Uh, he says, I'll die if I have to, uh, but I will keep your word forever to the end. It's like Peter, isn't it? Peter said, I'll die if I have to. Matthew 26, verse 35, Peter said, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. Uh, the interesting thing is at the end of that verse, uh, Matthew 26, 35, where Peter says, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. All the disciples said the same thing, it says. All the disciples said the same. And all the disciples, including Peter, ran from the site of Jesus' arrest in the garden. And Peter ended up denying Jesus exactly like Jesus told him he would. He denied him three times while Jesus was being tortured and while he was being accused falsely and while he was being spat upon. Peter was busy denying Jesus three times and the disciples were busy hiding out. Uh, they all denied Jesus and uh, saved their own skin. So we shouldn't be too eager to raise our hand and say that we wouldn't do that. However, um, this psalmist is saying that he will set his heart to perform the statutes of God. He will set his heart to be obedient to the word of God. And he says forever to the end. We've talked about this before in the class that uh, before any big decision like this happens in your life where you are called upon to make a statement for Christ, 
a statement of your obedience to Christ, a statement of your love for Jesus Christ uh, against an enemy or against someone who is the enemy of God. We need to make a decision in our hearts today, right now. We need to make a decision that we will not think about that when it happens. We will make the decision now to keep Christ, to not deny Christ. Uh, we need to have that resolved in our hearts so that when it happens, we don't have to think about it. Now, that may sound very easy to do, but uh, you don't want to be thinking that over at the time that you're being persecuted. Make that decision now and make your, your decision sure in studying the Word of God. And the more you're in the Word of God, uh, the stronger that resolve is going to be to not give up Jesus Christ in a tough situation. You need to be in the Word. You need to be hearing sermons being preached from the Word. You need to be in Bible studies. You need to be in your own home study. And the more you're in that, the stronger you get in Christ. And the more you will never, like the psalmist says, forever to the end, you will never want to give him up. He's too valuable. He's too precious. And we love him just too much to ever do that. We want to be with Jesus Christ. And if it means death, um, as, as hard as that decision is going to be, death frees us from this world and brings us into the presence and the forever of Jesus Christ. And so uh, I hope that, uh, that this last section has worked for you. I'm sorry that the cameras went out. We've got a couple of old phones that we use for the cameras. I don't know why. Uh, one of them went out at about 31 minutes and the other one went dead at about 38 minutes. Uh, but I figured I probably should uh, record the last few minutes here and add it. So uh, God bless you all. Hope you'll join us on Thursday nights at the church, uh, the Church of Christ at Logansport, uh, 630 on Thursday nights. And uh, I also hope if you're missing that, that, you'll, uh, that you will uh, join us live on Zoom during those uh, Thursday Bible studies. If you would like to do that, contact us for information on how to do it. And uh, if you miss those, uh, they'll be on this channel, the Restoration Preacher channel on YouTube. And I would really appreciate it if you would just take a moment right now uh, and subscribe to this channel. It doesn't cost you anything. I don't show up at your door trying to sell you stuff. Uh, it, it doesn't cost anything, but it, what it does is it tells YouTube that you like this channel and it, it causes YouTube to distribute it further and more widely around the world. And we want more people hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I would really appreciate it if you would like this video and if you'd subscribe to the channel and drop a comment and let us know who you are and where you're at. And, and uh, if you have any questions, you can ask them there. Uh, we, we appreciate all kind comments. And we, uh, we just uh, pray that you enjoyed this video. God bless you, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.